Overturning Roe, will the Supreme Court make good on Justice Thomas's threat to revisit other precedents once thought to be rock solid? Let's ask my panel. Buckle in for this one, folks. Jonathan Capehart, host of The Sunday Show on MSNBC, associate editor at The Washington Post and Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. Danielle Moody, host of the podcast Woke as, okay, AF, and co-host <laughs> Democracy-ish. <laughs> you almost got me there, Moody. Uh, and Eugene Daniels, MSNBC political contributor and White House reporter and playbook co-author at Pol Politico. Welcome to all of you. I've been waiting for this all day. Jonathan, we'll start with you. On a serious tip, should the LGBTQ community uh, look at what Justice Thomas has said, the threat that he's put out there on the street to reconsider cases like Lawrence and Obergefell, should they take that seriously? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I started, I, I mean, with this court, you have to take everything that they do seriously. But when that draft was um, leaked out uh, last month, and I read through Alito's draft, and yeah, it was all about an abortion case, but looking at the language, I kept thinking, well, then if you can say this about Roe, why can't you say this about a Burgefell? And then it wasn't until page 62 where Alito's draft says, oh, let, now listen, nothing that I've argued here should be considered for anything other than abortion. That same language is in the final opinion that was penned by Justice Alito. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Because that draft leaked out and we all read it, and I wrote a column saying, I don't believe you, Justice Alito. It's as if Justice Thomas, in his concurring opinion, wanted to put an ex exclamation point on it by saying, um, I think we need to re reassess the um, due process clause as it pertains to Griswold, Lawrence, and Obergefell. So while Alito is saying, nothing to worry about here or anything else, Justice Thomas says, uh, oh no, we're coming for right to contraceptive contraception, right to intimate relations between same-sex adults, and ma and marriage equality. And one more point, um, Chairman Steele. Cannot forget, Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, is the senior most member of the court, mm -hmm. and so he's the one who gets to decide who writes the majority opinions. Mm -hmm. And with the six to three conservative majority, that renders Ju Chief Justice John Roberts completely powerless to rein in that conservative supermajority. It, it, it really seems to be that way. And there's a lot of conversation going on in some Repo Republican circles about that, pretty much thinking themselves, what do we do now? Uh, the hounds have been unleashed. So, Eugene, on, on that point on the Democratic side, what have you heard uh, about the White House's reaction to the Dobbs ruling? And, and a lot of conversation and pressure, if you will, coming now for the president to do something about it. Uh, are there any concrete policy responses that he plans to announce? Yeah, I can't overstate how much pressure this administration is under right now when it comes to reacting to um, having a policy prescription for nibbling around the edges for uh, against the Dobbs decision that was decided on Friday, finding ways to protect abortion access around the country, if possible. The problem is, is there's not much th that they can do, right? He can't sign an executive order that would, legally, obviously, sign an executive order that would allow... Um, pregnant people to get abortions in this country, um, in every state, no matter what. That's not something that he can do with the power of the pen. What he can do and what they're planning on doing is using the using agencies to do this kind of work, to find ways to make sure that in states that it um, where it's not legal, that they have the ability to travel out of that state, to go to another. How What, what can they do there as an administration when it comes to making sure that the abortion pill um, is readily available? How can you do 
that because before the Trump administration made it so the FDA, the FDA said under the Trump administration that you can send it out, it can go through the mail. That has gone away under the Biden administration. So what else can they do on that point? And the other aspects of it is pushing Congress to do something, something I've, I've heard over and over since Friday. And on Friday, I was out um, in front of the Supreme Court for hours talking to folks out there. Um, and what their frustration is, they see a conservative, um, uh, the group of conservatives in this country who've been working on this for 49 years. And they feel like the conservatives have done everything they possibly can. They have, in words of a lot of people I talk to, stolen a Supreme Court seat. They feel like they have made promises over and over to do this and that Democrats have not taken that seriously, did not enshrine Roe into law, even when they have the opportunities um, in you know, 2009 during the Obama administration. And so there's frustration across the board with Democrats not doing more. So they want to see um, President Biden, Vice President Harris, the entire cabinet out there publicly talking about this, but also doing things that they haven't done before. It's talking about um, wanting a carve out in the filibuster for abortion rights in this country. It's something that the administration has pushed back against for basically everything else um, other than voting rights at this point. Um, and there also doesn't seem to be enough votes in Congress to even do that. So their, their hands are tied a lot on this one. Danielle, uh, travel with me, if you will, to Fantasyland, where, where both Senators Susan Collins and Joe Manchin have suggested they were misled by uh, Justice Kavanaugh and Gorsuch based on their testimony that Roe versus Wade was settled law. <laughs> okay, we believe this, right? That they actually believe and are confused and, and stunned that these, these justices voted the way they voted. Are they confused and stunned, or was it not their life that was going to be on the chopping block? Are they confused and stunned, or did it not matter because they are wealthy and they are white and they are privileged? Like, let's understand that the people that we've been asking to protect our rights are not the people, right? They are the privileged class. They have the economic ability, right, and the complexion to be able to move through this society and be covered. And so Susan Collins, what has she ever done except wag her finger and say, oh, my goodness. But he promised and he told me. But they're not the ones that are going to have to figure out, how do I get off from work and am able to travel across states? And what if I am criminalized and on my return back from leaving Texas, from leaving Alabama, from leaving Tennessee, that now I become a criminal in my state? They don't have to worry about these things, right? Because those are the problems of real people. They are the ones that are bringing in millions and millions of dollars a year. So they think a plane ticket is not a big deal. It is for somebody that's making less than $15 an hour. It is for people that do not have the the economic backing that they all have and enjoy, right? And so I think that it's really problematic, once again, for Joe Manchin, King Cole, right, to say to us, oh, well, I, I thought they told us the truth. You knew that they were lying. We knew that they were lying, right? And who is going to hold them to account? No one. We have 4,000 notices on Brett Kavanaugh about his predator behavior, right? And that was just stuffed in a drawer by the FBI and then delivered to the Trump White House, which did nothing. You have Clarence Thomas, who is a compromised justice, whose wife has been on the phone back channeling with Mark Meadows during the insurrection. She is where? Right? These people are in conversation. They are in cahoots. This justice, these, these justices are corrupt. And it's problematic that we just take it as these people are going to sit on the courts for the rest of our lives and we're going to wait around on our couches while they take away our rights one decision at a time. I told y'all to buckle up. <laughs> the, the panel, stick around. We'll see you later in this hour. Still ahead, how new attacks against the LGBTQ community are part of America's long history of anti-gay conspiracies. But first, Richard Louie is here with the latest headlines. Hey, Richard. Hey, Michael. Some of the stories are watching for you. President Biden spending day one of the G7 summit in Germany, urging allies to stand united against Russian aggression in Ukraine. His push comes as G7 leaders announce a ban on new imports of Russian gold. The leaders are also discussing a possible price cap on Russian oil exports. 
Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is not leaving imprisoned basketball star Brittany Griner behind. Sunday, Blinken called securing the basketball star's release from Russia a priority, but did not go into detail on that. Russian authorities detained Griner in February. And tens of thousands gathered in New York City for the annual Pride March on Sunday. Planned Parenthood marched in the parade following the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade as well. More Eamon with Michael Steele in for Eamon Wahideen right after this break.